<coughs> we have in a time, most of people they <coughs> would like the fame, would like the titles, would like the uh, degrees, what's shown up, or what's called in Arabic mazahir, what's apparent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala don't care about, doesn't care about these matters. Inna Allah la yanzuhu ila suwarikum wa ajsalikum. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rather look at your hearts. Okay? And here, what we need, all of us, and myself in particular, we need a purification of our hearts. Especially that I'm asked today to speak about a significant event that is going to take place, no doubt about it. And even the Muslims, you know, before and during that significant event, they are going to be chosen and dis di distinguished some <coughs> the right path and some with the shaitan, even among Muslims. Okay. So that's why here we need facts. We need something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala care about. We need what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it important to us. Okay? We should remember in this regard the hidden person, Sayyidina Uwais al Qarani, the one who was not known among his people at all, and he was placed by the Prophet as mentioned in an authentic hadith. Okay, and I imagine we have many persons, you know, similar to Sayyidina Uwais al Qarani. And those who are the real people, the, the, the real people of prophetic uh, significance, prophetic sciences, prophetic inheritance, and you name it. And we should <coughs> first love them and try to get connection to them. Generally speaking, those who come and sit on chair, you know, and many of them, they are useless. Okay? They are, uh, inshallah, if they recite some Quran, mention some hadith, but they may be inside much poorer than many of you, you know, and a real need, you know, of guidance <coughs> and support from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they mentioned, you know, in Aqidah books, that such type of people who are sort of knowledgeable, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not forgive them, they are going to be sent to hellfire before the infidels. So it's not a matter of being uh, famous, it's a matter of being accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we may ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to accept all of us, Amen. you know, and forgive all of our sins and deficiencies. That's, that's what by, you know, on the scale of Allah <coughs> subhanahu wa ta'ala. To speak about Sayyidina al-Mahdi, I would like, firstly, to narrate two hadiths, because they are sort of long, I'm not going to recite them in Arabic. I'm going to try to translate them, you know, and you may excuse me because I'm not that good in translation. First one, which is, should be important for all of us, speaking about the actions or the deeds that is going to be practiced by, by Muslims and make <coughs> those major events erupt you know, at the end of the time. And the other one, the other hadith, may be considered as the most perfect and real history of our time. See, the historian, they are not that accurate. You know. All of them, they are deviated. Here, all of you know, I'm not going to say no, you know for sure. Whenever the Prophet say anything, it's going to be the most accurate. Because 
not only us, you see. The people in his time, the non-believer in his time, they use whenever they hear anything from him, sallallahu alayhi wa to take it for sure, because they never experience any lie of him, sallallahu alayhi wa And this is narrated in Bukhari, when uh, uh, Sayyidina Sa'ad ibn Mu'az, his companion, told Umayyah ibn Khalab that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa said that he's going to kill him, he was completely scared and he doesn't want to go to bed, you know. And he cannot miss the appointment because this is appointment was set up by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he was driven all the, all the way to be killed in battle, you see. So these people, you know, the unbelievers, they use, whenever they hear anything from the Prophet to take it for sure, for certainty. And for sure we are going to be as such. But the point, not only to believe in this and take it, we should practice. We should live for it. We should interrogate us ourselves according to it. So, in the first hadith, the Prophet ﷺ gave us 15 signals that when these 15 signals they are going to be completed, you are going to have all the extraordinary events that is going to happen at the end of the time. What are these? 15 signals. This is narrated in Imam Tirmidhi <coughs> by two chains, one to Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib and the other one to Sayyidina Abi Hurairah. And according to scholars of hadith, both of these chains, they are weak, okay, but not significantly weak. We may try to take this, this information, you know, and understand it and apply it and try to correct what's wrong in ourselves, you know, in this regard. The Prophet said, whenever you see that the zakah is considered as a tax, that you don't uh, feel that you are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing it, you are paying a tax. And whenever the boat is which taken, you know, after fighting or whatever, is considered as special for certain people, which happened hundreds of years ago. And whenever anyone who is trusted is, is going to consider the others to, to trust him as a good chance to steal and rob of them. And whenever any one of us is going to make his friend too close to him and make his father, on the other hand, far of him, when we obey our wives and disobey our mothers, when we learn and spend a, a, a lot of money, not for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for dunya, and when we treat very well a person just because we are scared of him and to avoid the harm that might come from him. And when you have the chief of all tribes or the head of many communities, you know, as the worst among them, and when you have those governors, they are the worst again, and when you have the voices get loud in the mosques and we have an, an openly state, you know, wine is drunk all over the place and whenever you have those songs and the singers, you know, became too famous, you know, and available all over the place and the last one, when the la those who came later, the successor, they curse the previous one, these are 15 signs. Then, the Prophet ﷺ said, wait to see an earthquake and a red wind and uh, sheltering of Okay, 
going from like when time tank or cannon you know, to firing, firing, okay, and uh, Masih change in the creation and Khasif, uh, that's mean when you have the, 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 the land is going down. These are five descriptions given by the Prophet They may be or may not be what's done by the atomic bomb. You see, the atomic bomb, it has these five figures which were described by the Prophet said, wait for this, this five description, either they may be for one item or five different items, and he said, a sign after it is going to be like when you have tasbih and the thread is cut, how it comes, you know, right away, one after another. In another word, alhamdulillah, nowadays, we have a chance, we have a time to sit down and speak and discuss these matters. One day, we are going to be those of, uh, of us uh, who are, are going to reach that time, you know, they are going to be busy enough not to have a time to sit down and have free time to think about these matters. The other hadith was a description about four fitness that are going to happen at the end of the time. It's narrated by Abu Dawood, and I think it's authentic hadith, that there's four fitness the first one, the Prophet called it Harbun Wahab. It's fighting and running away. And this is, according to some scholars, one of the Indian Muslim scholars, I think he mentioned that this is, was the first world war. Because in, in this time, you know, especially in Middle East you know, and Turkey, we have many of the families, you know, Muslim families, they got scattered, you know, and they got far away, somewhere left in Europe, you know, and became <coughs> Christian, the other one between Syria and Turkey. And we have many, many problems. This was described by the Prophet as Harbun wa Harab, which means fighting and running away. away. And the second one was called Fitna to Sarra, Fitna of Wales. This was introduced to us, you know, when we have the Western civilization come to our countries. Because in Muslim countries, we were not, in life-wise, we were not that developed, you know, and we became and more uh, sophisticated in life and, and have more luxurious life you know, by the Western way that we have. And the Prophet called this as fitna. And he said, that this is going to be introduced to the Islamic world under a person who is from the Prophet family. And his name is known. Then, the th third one, uh, the Prophet called it this unique and beautiful description as if when you have your hip stand on a rib which means complete mismatch and inconvenience and as a matter of fact in general speaking this was the shape of our rulers you know in the Middle East and elsewhere you know so a lot of majesty, a lot of importance of nothing, okay? Like a hip stand on a rib. And the last one, the Prophet called it al duhayma duhayma tasghir, to make it smaller of dahma. What's the meaning of dahma in Arabic? Dahma means when you have the common people, they rush, you know, and make demonstration and many, many things, you know, which we start to face, you know, in our countries, you know, uh, one year ago or so. This is called by the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ said, it's going to affect all houses. And whenever it's said that it's over, it's going to carry on. Till the extent that in Muslim countries you are going to find a group of 
believers not mixed with others and group of hypocrites not mixed with others. Whenever you have this sign, you should pay, wait for Messiah Dajjal. This is in Sunan Abi Dawud. In Musannaf Abd al-Razzaq, another book of Hadith, is narrated by Sayyidina Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, as if it's his statement, but I think he should have heard it from some companion through the Prophet or whatever. But it's narrated as such, you know, in, in Musannaf Abd al-Razzaq, that there is fitna in Bisham. The Prophet spoke about fitna Bisham, and is going to start as fun among children or among boys <coughs> which happened you know a few months ago and this is going whenever it's cold in one area is going to erupt in another area same same description but in different different maneuver and by this the people they are going to be really uh, in very yani, uh, uncomfortable or not stable stage till Allah, uh, till a voice come, till a voice come that your Imam is so and so about Sayyidina Mahdi. So uh, I, I mentioned these two ahadiths just to scale ourselves according to first one and see how I, I, I explained it my way. My way may be wrong, you know, because we have I'm not a scholar, but we have many scholars, you know, in the past. They felt that they are about the time of being uh, meeting the Mahdi or whatever, okay? So here, I'm just putting the, this information, you know, try to apply it to our <coughs> current position nowadays, you know. I may be right or wrong about it, you know. But this, if I'm right about it, this make much more importance to pay our attention to the coming era which is going to be started insha'Allah by Sayyidina al-Mahdi. For sure, uh, I'm not going to go in details about his description. You know that his name matched the holy name of the Prophet ﷺ. His father's name is according to the, uh, the name of the father of the Prophet ﷺ. He is Hashimi. He is from the, uh, from the section of Sayyidina al-Hasan ibn Ali. Okay, he's going to be from the uh, yani in lineage related to Sayyidina al-Hasan ibn Ali. He's going to be in Medina al-Munawwara. We don't know uh, in, this, in those ahadiths that in my mind, it's not mentioned uh, where he was born, but he's going to be in Medina al-Munawwara when there's fitna and there's a death of a governor. And because of that, of the fitna, he's going to escape from Medina to Mecca. And an army will come from Syria <coughs> to fight against him. This is a bad thing about Syria, and he mentioned the good things, you know. <laughs> and it's going to uh, uh, occupy Medina Munawara for three days, you know, and uh, kill, uh, have massive killing and uh, uh, robbing money and uh, raping and many, many other wrongdoings, you know, for three days. And then this army is going to, this is the major sign of Sayyidina al-Mahdi, that this army, when he head toward Mecca, the, the army is going to have uh, the, 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 the earth swallow this army, you know, in a place called Al-Bayda, it's well known. And I have the picture of that particular place, which is called Al-Bayda, you know, which is uh, close to Zul Hulayfa. Those of you who uh, perform ihram from Zul Hulayfa, next to Medina Munawwara, there's a place, not exact place, but uh, it's near that, uh, that area, it's called Al-Bayda, and that army is going to be swallowed completely in that particular region. By this, the Mahdi is going to be given bay'ah between Al-Hajar Al-Aswad and Maqam Sayyidina Ibrahim by Abdal al-Sham, certain figures from al-Sham, and Usub al-Iraq, Asaib al-Iraq, this another rank of awliya, these are the people that they are going to be, give forcefully, he does not like it, but forcefully is going, they are going to give Sayyidina al-Mahdi bayah like this. For sure, uh, what is the most significant about this, 
first in his description that the Prophet said, he doesn't look like me physically, but his character is similar to, to my character, the Prophet And he is going to be ha give people good time to the extent that they will say, oh, we would like that our parents, they reach this point, you know, to see how happy we are. I was asked to speak about how to prepare ourselves to that time. Shall I speak about it or how we, to get ready, you know, of it? How much we have left? <laughs> okay, I'll be brief, inshallah, because I, I am not that good talker. <laughs> Firstly, are we ready to give submission to someone? <coughs> we pretend yes, but many of us know. Many of us we are going to, to see a righteous person or a biased person, and he will not put himself down and try to listen to that particular person. And this experience happened with the Prophet ﷺ. The most knowledgeable people of Prophet ﷺ, they were, they were Jewish people in Medina. And we are not exaggerating if we said that the Sadatun al-Ansar they became Muslim because of keep hearing from the Jewish people that a prophet is going to come, you know, and we are going to follow him and we are going to fight and kill you, you know. <laughs> they have, this is the habit in an opposite way, you know. Uh, and every time those Sadat and Ansar hearing this, they don't have book, they don't remember any message came to them from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they hear this from the Jewish people, you know, and they were lucky enough to, to convert and to become Muslim, you know, whereas the Jewish people who were considered as they know the Prophet sallallahu the way they know their children, they did not give submission to him. Why? Who is this person came from Arab city, uh, who did not read books like us, he's Ummi, and he, in their view, he doesn't know anything. We are the people who spend a lot of time, you know, reading and studying and do this and that. Are we going to give full submission to that person who is in our mind, you know, is much greater than all of our thoughts, not their thoughts? The same story is going to be repeated by with the man. And that's why many scholars, they say, the most who is going to show his enmity, that he is enemy of Al-Mahdi, the scholar of that time. They are the most. It's not to, to tell you not to t learn and to read, no. It's to, t to learn or to tell us besides what we are doing. I'm sorry to tell you, to behave ourselves. How? Now we have the time to train ourselves. Okay? When, when Sayyidina Mahdi comes, it's over. You cannot train yourself. Now you can train yourself. How? Put yourself down for your fellow Muslims. Okay? As this is part of the tradition of the Prophet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed him. وَاخْفِتْ جَنَاحَكَ للمؤمنين. If the Prophet ﷺ, how great is the Prophet ﷺ, was addressed to do so, how should such sinful person like me practice? Okay. I'm telling you, nowadays, I may have pessimistic, you know, look, you know, but I look at Muslims, you know, in general. They don't accept each other. They don't put themselves, you know, show humbleness to each other, except, you know, if the to their group. Assume the man is not from your group, what you are going to do? You are going to say, this is a liar, this is fake Mahdi. Okay? Here, we should have open mind, we should have open heart to all fellow Muslims. 
I'm not telling you that they are right in all of their matters. No, they may have mistakes. They may not show the love that you show to the Prophet They may not be that good practitioner. They may, may not. They may be sinful in one way or another. Okay. But here, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not telling you to to, to do this with all people declaring themselves as Muslim. I'm speaking about what we call Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Again, don't misunderstand me, because in my observation, I have three or four groups. They call themselves Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the other as not Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, and this is incorrect. Title. How we get the, the title of Ali Sunnah al Jama'ah from where? From the Prophet. He said, As Sawad al A'zam. Who are Ali Sunnah al Jama'ah? They are not going to be from certain race or certain group or certain people or certain, certain ideology. They are the majority of Muslims. <coughs> to make it more clear, you know, in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, people, they were equal in their love to the Prophet ﷺ? No. No. Some of them, like Sayyidina Rabi'a ibn Ka'b al when he, at the first moment he saw the Prophet ﷺ, he cannot help it, you know, to stay away of the Prophet. He's going to join him, walk with him, wherever he go. And then, at night time, the Prophet wants to go to his house. Rabbi, I cannot go inside the house. What is he going to do? He's going, he's going to stay, uh, spend the whole night at the door of the Prophet <laughs> Telling himself, if the Prophet needs some water or something, you know, I'm going to present it, bring it to him. But in the reality, he needs something from the Prophet <laughs> And when he was asked about the Prophet ﷺ, what do you want? I'm going to make dua for you. He said, I want to join you in the hereafter, you know. And yeah, this is his, this is what occupy his heart, what occupy his mind. Not only for this life, for this life and for the hereafter. To say myself, to say that I am I'm a lover of the Prophet ﷺ is too easy. Everyone has it. To pretend that I uh, love the Prophet is too easy. To try to bring some tears, you know, it's too easy. Okay, it's not uh, difficult. But to have your heart connected completely to the Prophet all the time, this is what, uh, uh, this is what counts. This is what is going to be considered as a matter of have strong connection with the Prophet Inshallah, it's not difficult on us. The Prophet said, Make a plenty of salawat ala Nabi Try to follow his sunnah Nabi Sharifa. Try to remember him. Whenever you eat, remember the Prophet. Whenever you sleep, you remember the Prophet. Whenever you have happy event, remember the Prophet. Whenever you have a sad event, remember the Prophet In all of your matters, you know, try to remember the Prophet Get connected to him. Follow his steps his steps, follow his tradition, make a lot of salawat, and by this, inshallah, as the Prophet instructed Sayyidina Abu Hurairah, inshallah, you are going to be with him in the hereafter. This is what they want. Okay. So here the point, we have this type of people in the Prophet time and in our time, like Rabia. They spend the night in those areas, you know, there, you know, even though they may be in the UK, they may be in China, they may be elsewhere, but they are going to spend the night next to the feet of the Prophet And in the, the time of the Prophet we have some people, they will come and meet with him for one hour or so, and return back to their house. Right? Did the Prophet call these people as kafir? Did he reject him? No. He considered all of them Muslim. If we know that this is real lover and the other one is half-half, 
for sure the Prophet knows these people much more than us. Okay? He has his own look, you know, to, to those hearts, you know. And yet the Prophet to best of all my knowledge, and you may correct me, from apparent way he treated all of them equally. Rather, whenever he has some money or whatever, he would give those who is considered as 50-50 uh, or whatever, those to, uh, he used to give them much more of the money that is given to him. <coughs> and that's what he mentioned to Sadat in Al-Asar. He said, well, would you like to have everyone go with sheep and camel and you return back with the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So here, this is the first point. We should get along with all Muslims. Okay? Of as sawad al azam the majority. That is Sunnah al Jama'ah by the definition of the books, not by our definition, because our definition is, has been made misleading in Allah. Okay? And this will lead us to the second point. The Prophet used to give dunya to who? To, who? to those who are not that close to him. Okay? You should give up dunya. Why? Why you should give up dunya? Because <coughs> if you are going to join Sayyidina Nabi, you are going to look very bad person. Why? Because in the time of the Sayyidina Nabi, as mentioned in Sahih Muslim and elsewhere, the money is, and gold is going to erupt, you know, and you have a lot of it. And those followers of Sayyidina Mahdi, they don't care. They are going to step on you know, gold and just don't care about it. <coughs> so it's very really bad shape to have one person, you know, collecting, you know, and the other, you know, step and ignore those things. And that's what the Prophet said when, uh, yani in his time, many of the companion and other inhabitants in Medina, you know, they used to be too poor, you know, no money at all. And when some of the companions brought some gold with him, you know, the Prophet said, whatever you brought with, the, with, with you is equally similar to the stones, you know, on the outside, in the, in the desert, you know. It's of no difference. And this should be our aqidah, you know. We believe inside ourselves. There's no benefit or harm is going to affect me without the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Money doesn't help me. Friends doesn't help me. Not, not, nothing of these matters is going to help me without the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third point. If you agree with me that we are close to that time, let's hope that we are close, you know, I don't know. I advise myself and everyone to load. This is time of loading. What do I mean by this? <coughs> Those of you who are capable of memorizing Quran or teaching Quran, or seek Islamic sciences, they should load themselves because we are in real need of them you know, for the coming time. There's no books, no computers, no libraries. Okay? Those who are not as such, they should load themselves, you know, by a plenty of reciting Quran Kareem, plenty of remembrance of Allah Dukar, Tahajjud, my Tahajjud and those matters. Why? Because all this is going to make the mercy of Allah come, which we are in real need of it in this time and in that blessed time that we are going to What we have heard, this may be right or wrong, many of the Muslims, they are not going to reach that time, even though they are going to be close to the time of the Mahdi. And there's a lot of fit and a lot of war and destroying that is going to take away many of the Muslims. 
And we have few who are going to survive and stay in the time of the night. I don't know myself. Am I going to be of those who are going to survive or going to be taken away before? But what I know, if I load myself, you know, and I'm in this position, I'm going to be in the best of my position, you know, if I'm going to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or be sent to the Sayyidina Mahdi, you got this point. So, if you believe in the, uh, this point that we are close, we should, you should load yourself, okay? Load yourself by <coughs> worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or by Islamic sciences, you know, or by the, and as I said, you should look and observe our relation with each other. I think we should stop here, you know. You may excuse me, I have, I went over the time. Sure. Um, people can ask questions if they want to. Uh, you can either put your hand up or, including the sisters, or you can write it down and just pass it over uh, to the side and ask the question. Um, my first question, I'll ask the first question. That's okay. <laughs> You spoke briefly about Imam Ahmad the other coming of the Jal. If you could just briefly mention about the Jal. The Jal was described by the Prophet as fitna, instructed us to seek shelter from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against this fitna, fitna the Sayyid Dajjal. Should have the, the four commandments: "Adu kan adab al qabr, adu kan adab al nar, adu kan fitnat al mahya al mamad, wa auzu bi kan shafi fitnat al masih al jannah." And the Prophet ﷺ described it as this, the most or the greatest fitna ever from the creation of Sayyidina Adam till the hereafter. Fitnat al dajjal. Why? Because this is a slave of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, given by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala all the extraordinary. Strength. He may make a hiya mauta. He may make the rain coming. He may make if someone against him, you know, his land, poor land, you know, without anything. He may make someone rich. He may make someone poor, you know, all by permission of Allah subhanahu wa taala, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa taala as a fitna. <coughs> so again, this I should highlight <coughs> those lovers of dunya. They are the most vulnerable people, you know, to be yani, flanked flunk, by, by this fitna, okay? Why? Because they love dunya. And the dunya all from Allah <coughs> is by the hand of this particular person. That's why when I think of the successors, if I'm not, I forgot the name. He said, if the Dajjal is going to show up in our time, it's going to be stoned by our boys. <laughs> Why? Because those people, you know, they, they don't care about dunya. And the Jal cannot trick them, you know. He's going to be stoned by our boys. But he's going to show up where the minds, they are gone. Why? Because they are behind dunya, okay? And uh, uh, the hearts, they are connected to something, Abdul Dinar, Abdul Dirham, and, and, and you know, all these slaves, you know, of something except, uh, not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something else, you know. So here comes the point, you know. Here, at the Dajjal, he is one of the major fitna. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him many extraordinary matters, and he is going to make many of the believers convert to non-believers, you know, by this. Okay, so uh, what we should do, firstly we should always make this dua that I mentioned, you know, in each prayer make this dua. We should try to treat our heart to get out the dunya from our heart. And if we reach that point, we should don't, don't try to meet with him. Regardless of how strong you are in your aqidah and in your belief, don't try to meet with him as the Prophet instructed us. And if you have the chance to be in Medina or Mecca, 
would be much better even now if you want to go it's much better you see? so because the prophet said that he is prohibited of entering medina and mecca he's going to stay 40 days in the, the earth the prophet said the length of first, of first day is like a year complete year the second one like a month third one like a week and the, the rest like days and toward the end they are going to be like when you burn a wooden matter you know which takes two hours you know it's going to be too fast and he's going to be killed by Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam the famous prophet and messenger who is going to descend in at the end of the time you know as a follower of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and uh, he's going to kill al Masih al-Dajjal in a city called Al-Lud is well known now in Palestine after that, Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam, I think, Sayyidina Mahdi will stay in the, on the earth for seven or nine years. This is what mentioned the hadith. Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam is going to stay, Maryam is going to stay for 40 years. He's going to be buried inside the Hajj al Nabawi by some people. Um, question from one of the brothers who just texted me is that if you could please carry on. You know, in, in our times, we see in some Muslim countries um, the building of sky, skyscrapers and the spending of a lot of wealth on big buildings and tourism. And it's actually quite a popular holiday destination for many Muslims. I was wondering, is there a connection between the building of these big buildings and you know, spending lots of money on these tall buildings? Is this a sign of the end of times? And if so, does it mean that it's not a good thing for Muslims to travel to these countries for, for tourism? For the f first part of the question, for sure, this is mentioned in Hadith Sahih. <coughs> Even the Imam Sutu considered it as mutawatir. وَتَرَى الْحُفَاتَ الْعُرَاتَ رِعَاءَ الشَّاءِ يَتَطَاوَلُونَ فِي الْبُنْيَانِ And this, what you see of tall, very tall buildings, you know, this mentioned in Hadith, authentic Hadith, Rather, Imam Suyuti called it mutawatir. Okay. Uh, is this good sign or bad sign? <coughs> this is like any matter of the dunya matters, you know. If it's done for the sake of Allah, it's going to be good, otherwise bad. Yani, I cannot call it halal or haram. Okay. Even the signs of qiyamah, the one I mentioned in the 15 signs, all of them, they are really bad. Okay. But one of the signs of qiyam al qiyam is Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam, which is not Bad signs is good sign. And being sign of Yom al Qiyamah doesn't tell that this is bad sign. It could be a good sign. Okay. Traveling يعني, for those who are uh, <coughs> busy serving Islam, no time to go there. <laughs> for those who want to have a peace of mind, they may go, you know, but in a, a, a condition that no, no ma'asi, okay, keep up prayers, okay, if they may miss prayers, they, and if they are going to keep up their prayers, you know, or whatever, inshallah, it's permitted to go there. Someone's asked the question, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give such powers to the job to corrupt us? Because... <coughs> Shall I answer this question? <laughs> okay, I'm going to answer it. You may hit me and kick me out. <laughs> we started to so sell <coughs> particles of our religion to dunya. I'm one of them. We saw that a lot, but we still consider ourselves as shiuch, sit there with full respect. We are in a time when of our famous shiuch in Syria, I did not uh, sit with him because he passed away roughly 20 years before my birth. He used to say about his time, and for sure about that time, that we are in the time that the person is going to be in the morning believer and in the evening non-believer. 
Why? Because he sold his religion for a cheap price of life. When we try to look about our priorities, for many of us, the religion comes at the end. I don't look at where is the best place for me to practice my deen. I look at the best place to earn money. When I have children, I should put them in very highly respected schools and colleges, you know, because they are they, to just to secure their career, you know, because they want to work later on. But what's about Quran? What's about, and these are all things, you know. Inshallah, they will come. Inshallah, inshallah, they will come. Yeah, in our, in another word, in our practice, not all of us, but many of us, they are going to give the priority to their life, you know, in all of their aspects. Okay. And they make religion, yani, uh, inshallah, uh, when I return back from job, not during winter, during summer, I have a time to go and pray Isha in the mosque. You see, and here it comes whenever uh, I'm free, I have free time, you know. As if I, I was born here or present, I'm present here for dunya, not to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Wa ma ins illa liya'budu. We were not created for any purpose except to worship Allah. I'm not going to ask them to, you know, to bring their provision or uh, something to feed me. And the worst among us, those who sell their religion for a cheap price of them. In Al Hassan Basri said, It's better for me to gain or earn money from playing mu music than to earn money from my religion. And we observe, I'm not going to go <coughs> deeply in this matter, you know, but it has a lot of pain in my heart. We observe of famous you, famous high figures, you know, famous scholars, you know, that. They give us, give a portion of all of their religion, you know, or give fake fatwa, or try to uh, go by the way, the super powers, they, they want us to go by nowadays, and to consider the whole world as a small village, and all, and all believers, you know, of different religions, they are the same and they are equal. You heard about something, I heard about other things, you know. We hear it every day, you know. This is at least, for me, I may be wrong, it means my religion, not my religion. This so-and-so religion became too cheap for him. And it became a matter of showing the others that I am civilized, I get along well with them, you know. And this is, I cannot be sure about it, but this, this is very warning sign that he may lose his religion one day. And all of us, we are going to face a time, there's no doubt about it, that we are going to be squeezed completely, you mean, you know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to take the soul out of us. But I understand, I never tested this, you know, before. <coughs> Inshallah, coming soon. But, but when you taste this, you know, everything fake in your mind and in your heart is going to be gone away. What's going to be left? What you lived for all the time. Okay? Sayyidina Mu'az ibn Jabal was dying. <coughs> significant chest heaviness, heaviness, and not able to breathe. What did he remember in this moment? He said, Oh Allah, choke me as well as much as you want. You know that I love you. 
This was his last one. In our time, see, I used to live in U.S. And we have an Egyptian person there, you know, who had a severe car accident. And he was taken urgently to the hospital. And the surgeon was one of our colleagues or friends. You see, this person, he bled a lot. And he was under anesthesia for surgery. And for the surprise of our friend surgeon or colleague surgeon, you see, yani, in, uh, <coughs> how conscious is this person, you see, with massive <coughs> bleeding and anesthesia. This person started to say, La ilaha illallah, and he passed away shortly. Yani, in another word, we should, now we still have the time to clean our hearts, you know, of everything except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what is going to count for us, you know. For sure we are going to leave this, uh, leave this world, you know. And the, 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 the major disastrous matter about it, if something else is occupying my heart, and it has the superior last word, I'm going to be I'm going to be shifted from this this world as Kafir, not Muslim. That's why it's too serious. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of his mercy, started to show people who is lover of dunya and who is real lover of him subhanahu wa ta'ala before this this time. You know, uh, a lot of people know about uh, uh, the Illuminati or the Freemasons. They say that uh, it's conspiracy that they're preparing for the coming of the, the Jal, and uh, <coughs> people believe in them. And a lot of people uh, they believe it's not true. I would like to, like to ask: uh, Is there anything in the Hadith or anything according to your knowledge about this people? It's to do with this conspiracy theories like uh, the Freemason or the Illuminati. I, I have no idea about it, so I cannot answer this question. Okay. Um, uh, in your talk, you mentioned about the Abdaz of Sham and the righteous of uh, Iraq. Um, since you are from the land of Sham, uh, blessed land, could you tell us about some of the Abdal that are alive today, that are present there? Or what are, or if you can, um, what are their distinguishing marks or signs by which we can recognize them? Okay. And if I may pick up on the brother's question, uh, in a, if, uh, phrased in another way, he's asking, are there people who are working for Imam al-Mahdi, like his helpers, his, uh, his ministers, and like that, are there people who are working for the Dajjal before he comes? Uh, I think that's in, in a general way what he is asking. For the first portion of the question, description of Abdal, as mentioned in the uh, Prophet ﷺ hadith, they did not gain this rank by a plenty of prayer or fasting or charity. They gained it by pure hearts, Okay. and generosity and being getting along with all Muslims. This is their description. For the second portion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said فَالْمُدَبِّرَاتِ أَمْرَى And this is a verse in Quran which means for sure Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable he has the most power to, to do everything without help of anyone. But this is the way, the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have this universe run, you know. He is going to use some of the angels. He's going to use some of the righteous people. He's going to use... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ability to convey all his message, you know, without any messenger. But out of his wisdom, he, alhamdulillah, sent us our beloved messenger, you know, and you name it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created these matters 
has a maneuver of doing matters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَالْمُدَبِّرَاتِ أَمْرًا yeah, That any command or anything wanted to be done, you know, on the, in the universe is going to be done by certain angels. So, to answer your question, yes, there is some of the creation, there is some angels work to have Al-Mahdi come, there are some angels work to have Al-Dajjal come, there are some angels to, uh, or there are some righteous people to make Al-Mahdi come, there are some righteous people to make Al-Dajjal come, there are some scholars, you know, to make Al-Mahdi come. I heard about certain people, you know, righteous people, they said so and so, they told about some Quranic teacher, they are teaching the followers of the Mahdi. And there are some human beings also preparing for the Dajjal to have a lot of black mag magician, you know, and a lot of people who are going to surround him. So, uh, yes, you are going to have a complete crew, you know, working for Al Mahdi, and complete crew working for the Dajjal. But how, and uh, don't ask me because I don't know. So, uh, a follow up question. Do you know, uh, in your uh, opinion, uh, who may be uh, from the Abdals in, in our time today? The most famous one, the hidden one that try to mimic Sayyidina Wais al Qarani, is well known by Sayyidi Tanbir, is Sheikh Shukri al Luhafi. And it is almost everyone speak about him that one of the Abdal. Hmm? Yeah, we all know that one. I mean, I know that one. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know someone else. Maybe, maybe someone that doesn't tell us on the wall. Uh, question from this is, what advice can you give uh, sisters about the end of times in relation to raising children? I guess that's for the brothers as well. How should we raise our children in different times? <coughs> Not only for raising children, yes, you should raise your children, you know, uh, <coughs> by loading them, as we said, load your children. But not in a way to make them fed up, you know, of it. In a very nice and gentle way, load your children. But what is more important that you did not ask about, <coughs> this is not to put women down, you know, but the Prophet Sallallahu said the most <coughs> followers of the Dajjal, they are from one woman's side. And I think because they love dunya much more. So please, the, our sisters, you know, on the woman's side, try to treat yourself, you know, to get rid of dunya and those fake matters that occupy our hearts, you know. And by this, you are going to help the husbands, you know, a lot and make them, make the, the house more peaceful. After the Khalifas, you had the kings and the tyrants, and now the tyrants are being removed one by one, and after them will be the time of Imam Mendi. So going of the current revolutions, could we say we are very close to this time, i.e. within a few years? If my explanation to fit that Duhayma is accurate, yes, we are close, but we may expect that we are closer than the reality, you know, because the Prophet <laughs> said, Kullama qilan qadat tamada. Whenever it's said that it's over, it's going to last for a little bit longer, you know. So, okay, we may be right, we may be wrong. Why we should observe ourselves? Because we have many famous scholars, you know, more knowledgeable and more righteous, they thought that their time is the time of Sayyidina al-Mahdi. And uh, to best of our knowledge, Sayyidina al-Mahdi did not show up. So uh, that's why we should put this under consideration. I think by loading business, we are not going to lose anything. Um, there is a dispute amongst scholars whether to say, alayhi salam, uh, it has to be exclusive for prophets and angels. Why do we say Sayyidina Imam Mahdi alayhi salam? This best mentioned by Imam al-Nawawi, 
Rahimallah. It might not, yani, knowledge. We may have someone else spoke about it. Here you have certain dua mentioned after Allah. We say Allah Azza wa Jal. This is not dua, description, let's say. We say Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We say similar things to the prophets. When we say companion, we say radiyallahu anhu. When we say about successors, tabi'in, we say rahimahullah. Okay. Imam now I say this doesn't mean that Sayyidina Muhammad is not Azza wa Jal because he is Aziz and Jalil. Doesn't mean that the companion they are not alayhi salam because you may send salam to them. Okay. But since it became a sign of some Muslim section who are not Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah, we shouldn't we should avoid using these terms, you know. Not because they are haram, because they became macro, because they became the signals of the others. Okay. So it's better for us to stick to what our scholars, you know, have their terminology, you know, about how, what to say after the holy name of Allah, what to say about the name of the prophets, what to say uh, after the names of companion and you name it. Not because it is haram, no. Because we don't want to mimic the other sections, you know, in one of our, even in our speech. Um, and the Gog, the Gog already been released. They are going to be released after the killing of Al-Masih al-Dajjal. And during the time of Sayyidina Isa ibn Maryam, as mentioned in long hadith, I think it's in Sahih Muslim by Nawaz ibn Sam'an narrated that the show of the people Ya'juj and Ma'juj in our area, because they are going to show in Syria and Palestine and these regions, you know, is going to happen after the killing of al Masih al Dajjal. So it's not the time. It is mentioned in the Quran, فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ رَبِّي جَعَلَهُ دَكَّاءً Whenever it's time of the hereafter or يوم القيامة, this is going to be uh, broken down, you know, or uh, demolished, all of it, you know, this the uh, fence or whatever they are imprisoned in. We have a question there, shall we ask? Yeah. Yeah. You advise us to treat all Muslims fairly and kindly, and you said that you, you praise some of the Muslims in that in, the, in their fairness towards all Muslims, and you, you mentioned that it was a it was a Sunnah of the Prophet Now, in treating people fairly, can we have a distinguishing line where we can understand who is Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah and who are those that claim to be Muslim but do not fall into that category? Is there a clear cut line? There's a very clear cut line, but unfortunately it has been uh, uh, made vague, you know, by many of us, okay? That's why what I observe, correct me if I'm wrong, those among different sections who have the uh, chance to get well educated, you know, they are going to understand this point very well, you know. Those who just stick to your, to their environment, you know, or whatever, they are going to be far away of understanding this matter. Okay? And the worst, you know, to call a Muslim as a kafir. If Imam Mahdi makes the call, uh, do we have to go to him and will we have to leave our families behind to join the army in Al no need, no. It's in no need of anyone, you know. The one who wants to to go. Yani, I heard some statement. You see, yani, this what make me warn you because there is famous tariq Sufi. You see, what I understand, tariq Sufi, they should be the more most people who are st uh, stuck to the Mahdi, okay, and their sheikh. They narrated that their sheikh told them, we are in our way, if the Mahdi called us, we are going to go to him. In my heart, he's not going to call you. If you don't want to come, don't come. Okay. And here's the point. 
when I get proud of myself to the extent if the Mahdi wants me, no, he doesn't want you. You should look for him. You are in need of him. You see? And you see this point? I forgot to mention uh, mention another point. They are hard, there's some hard time, you know, in this, uh, the time of the Mahdi. Same as in the time of the Prophet. In the time of the Prophet, they have very hard time and difficult day. But those people, the Sadana Sahaba, if you give the choice for any one of them to substitute his time with any time, he's not going to accept this. In the time of the Mahdi, there's hard and difficulties. Yani in one hadith that he's going to invade Constantinia, which is called Istanbul now, and then they, they are going to fight against <coughs> Roma. The Roman people, they are going to come in very huge number. And the Prophet said, said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, of the army of the Mahdi, one said is going to be defeated. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala will not accept their repentance at all. And some, uh, one said is going to be killed. They are the best of shuhada ever. And one, of, one said they are going to occupy or uh, gain the victory, see? And you have some difficulties. That's why we should put this in our mind. Are, are we ready to give up some of our luxurious life for this purpose? This is the, the point. And uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the man is not going, going to call anyone. We should run to him. And this is what I mentioned, you know, even the Prophet said, in the hadith that is going to be given by a forcefully, he doesn't want it, you know, by Abdal Sham. These are one of the uh, yeah, the highest rank, you know, in our nation. Abdal Sham wa Asa ibn Iraq, they are going to give bay'ah to him. So, no, if you are busy, just stay wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs> shed some light on the hadith about the army from uh, Khurasan with the black flag, black flag. This mentioned, I think, in Mustadrak al-Hakim and other books, you know, some they said it's not that strong, the other they said it's strong. But <coughs> whenever you read hadith of the Prophet read it, and it sees this point, my experience, you see, what was my understanding of Fitna al Duhayma before what happened, you know, in the Middle East was different. And now it's different when you see Bi'abiyo as if he is looking and seeing and describing, okay. So that's why I don't want to spoil this hadith, you know. I believe in it, you know, but perhaps, perhaps my explanation is going to spoil it, okay. So let's see how it's going to come. But put it in your mind, and those who, of us who are going to be in that particular time, they are going to observe it in the best way described. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ is nasih on Amin. He's confident and he, he is nasih, give us advice, you know. That's why he's going to describe it the best way for those who are going to be in that particular na time to know it. And no one is going to be deviated except those who don't want to listen to the Prophet. <laughs>